Hello and welcome to this episode of Self Made. I'm your host, Dee Brown. My next guest received an education in psychology from the University of Maryland and became an internationally recognized expert in team and leadership development. He is the founder and CEO of the Sports Facility Advisory. He is a passionate social entrepreneur and innovator who has dedicated more than 25 years to development of businesses that empower and enhance communities. Please help me wel welcome Dave Pathak to Self Made. Dev, I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Well, thank you, Dee. I'm glad to be here and appreciate what you're doing. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, Dev, you have quite an interesting story, uh, one that I think deserve to be highlighted. And, and I think our viewers need to hear, hear this story. Uh, I know that you grew up in uh, Maryland uh, as a child. Uh, talk to me about your childhood and what it was like. Well, D, as you know, you know, and, and as I talk about my TED talk, I grew up in an intensely abusive home. So uh, from the time I was a young boy until uh, my father passed away at the age of 15, uh, I experienced long and torturous experiences of abuse. Uh, but it was torture, not abuse. And there's a little bit of a difference in that it required a kind of endurance. Um, he, I attempted suicide at the age of nine because it was just so, so difficult to survive and to feel so unprotected and uh, luckily survived that. And at the age of 15, when he passed away, I was relieved. You know, as a father now, it's hard to imagine right. a son at that age feeling that. But those, those roots and those difficult experiences now I see as the basis for what drives me and what's allowing us to do what we're doing um, in impacting communities. So no, uh, that's how that's how difficult it was. And I know I'm not alone. I know you have a lot of viewers who've come up with very difficult in very difficult circumstances. No, absolutely. You know, myself, um, you know, I'm no different. I, I didn't come from an abusive home, but I did come from a fatherless home where I had no relationship with my father uh, at all. And uh, when he passed away, um, you know, I, I felt nothing at all, you know, from it. I uh, didn't attend the funeral. I just had no, no connectivity there. And so it's, I know for a lot of people, especially me having six children, I, I just couldn't imagine, you know, being in, in, in that scenario. So um, different circumstances, but yet some similarities there. Uh, with, coming from that type of uh, environment, that type of background, what, what motivated you to um, go to college? Well, you know, I was, um, I, first of all, I studied psychology and I did that because I really needed it. I wanted to understand how to um, use my mind to achieve the things I wanted to achieve. Um, in, in those years, I spent a lot of time dreaming about the future and I survived it by visualizing a successful future. Um, I survived it by coaching myself. And I mean that very intentionally. I. Uh, say to folks all the time, you know, if you want to make it in this world, you have to be both coach and player, right? You're coach and player, even when you're engaged in a conversation with your wife, partner, spouse, whatever that might be, right? It's That's how right. You handle it. So, so those experiences that I grew up with, they equipped me with that. When I went to um, University of Maryland, I wanted to better understand how does one achieve success. I was really interested in motivation. I was interested in leadership and I was interested in overcoming adversity. And so I pursued psychology for that reason. So again, you have a psychology uh, degree, but now you run an organization uh, that develop uh, sports facilities around the, around the globe. So how did you end up in that space coming from the psychology background? And so as a uh, kind of a, to set the stage, uh, I majored in psychology in college as well. So, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious to hear your story. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, an undergraduate degree in psychology doesn't typically land you where where I am or where you are. Um, I, yours was maybe more advanced, but the um, really what I started to work for Outward Bound, I learned a lot about uh, youth 
and team development, and I really cared about kids, that experience left me still today with a constant awareness that people are suffering and a kind of energy to go out and make the world a better place. I just, I just wake up that way. Um, uh, and so eventually after uh, moving through a couple of other small startups, I learned about the sports facilities marketplace, um, started doing some consulting as an advisor in the marketplace and realized there was a real market opportunity. Um, so I built a small team. Um, I had, I, at one point, D, and I know you have similar stories, I had to borrow $500 from my best friend to keep the lights on and just to be able to um, eat for the next few weeks. I'd go to the mailbox every day waiting on that check. But we, we rented a small apartment that was not supposed to be used as an office. We built a website and we began with our advisory services. Uh, very quickly, Jason Clement, the, the co-founder with me, he and I built, started to build a team and we took what little cash we had from our sales and we churned it back into the business. We've been doing that for the last 19 years. We've never borrowed a dollar. Uh, we have just um, served clients well. And so how do we get there? Um, it begins with vision. And I, I'd be happy to tell you the story about that. No, absolutely. We would, we would love to hear the story. So, you know, I, I was talking to my wife about this this morning. I was talk, telling her that I was going to um, see and be talking to you. And I, I shared that, um, that, and she was recalling when I wrote down on a piece of paper, the, the most ridiculous and audacious objective. I, for some reason, I, as I started thinking about the future, I wrote down to impact hundreds of millions of lives. And I thought that was, I didn't understand what that meant, D, and I did not think that I could part possibly do that. And then I wrote, well, how do you get there? My, the mission statement still today for the sports facilities companies, if we, I knew that if we could improve the health and the economic vitality of communities, we could do that. But we had to be a partner to those communities. We had to transform outcomes in communities. And then if we could do that and communities would engage us, we could spread into a, a, a much larger uh, field and impact more lives. And then sport, was what lifted me in all of that growing up. The one thing that I had was I had experience and a taste of triumph. Yeah. People can have it in on a local field or court. They can have it for me. I had it in the local swimming pool, but the chance to win as a kid, um, it was one of the only times I had evidence that I was worth anything to anyone right. was when I won in sport. And so the opportunity to match that childhood with and create triumphant and winning experiences and bring kids together in communities where they can participate in sport. That um, had never been on my mind, to be honest with you, but it became the mechanism that we've used to reach. Now this year we'll have 44 million visits in our venues. Uh, you know, if you multiply that over the many years, we're doing exactly what that vision statement that I believe God put on my heart uh, said we'd do. You know, Dev, I think I told you this when uh, I first met you. Uh, a lot of the things you say really resonate with me because uh, I have the same philosophies. I built my company around the same principles uh, and those being being able to uh, impact communities, transform communities and provide opportunities to the citizens of, the, of those communities that they ordinarily wouldn't have access to. And then you went on today. I heard something different when you talked about, you know, the sports component. And I know that sports was a defining uh, aspect of my life. Uh, I did not play beyond high school, uh, but playing high school athletics gave me the opportunity to, to win, gave me an opportunity to be a leader, and gave me an opportunity to develop a mindset that um, you know, I can overcome you know, any type of obstacles uh, thrown my way. Uh, you have done a great job with your organization uh, propelling your mission uh, around the globe. Can you tell my viewers just some of the type of projects that you guys own and operate around the country? Yeah, so um, we operate a large number, the largest network of tournament style facilities in the country in tourism destinations. And then we also operate parks and recreation systems. But our tournament facilities are the Myrtle Beach Sports Center, Cedar Point Sports Center and Cedar uh, Fair, uh, associated with Cedar Fair Entertainment. Um, and Sandusky, Ohio, we're Panama City uh, Beach. We operate the Panama City Beach Sports Facility, Sports Complex um, in Branson, Missouri, and so on. And those facilities host 
tens of millions of visits, produce multiple night overnight stays. But equally important to that, they provide an inventory for that local community where they can have access to sport. And so we often use sports tourism as a mechanism. And then we have literally um, 3,000 projects that we've served as advisors uh, on in municipalities and communities across the country. I'll tell you one of my favorite, D, and then I'll stop here, is the Rocky Mount Events Center. Um, Rocky Mount Events Center um, was used to um, impact downtown Rocky Mount, North Carolina, which was suffering from some very traditional and consistent patterns that we've seen in the South and fr frankly throughout the country. Right. Um, a lot of it driven by inequity. And we were able to open the Rocky Mount Events Center downtown and really transform downtown Rocky Mount into something that now citizens can have pride in and that's produced new jobs. And so we're just really excited about that facility. But Dev, you've also taken this company to uh, an international platform. So not only are you developing projects uh, that are impacting communities within the uh, United States, internationally, you're also uh, part of projects such as the National Stadium of the Bahamas and the Canada uh, Games Project. Uh, tell me about these international projects that you're doing and how you feel like those projects are impacting your company's market position. Well, I think, I think the international projects I always have big flair, but at the end of the day, it's still a hyper local um, set of goals and objectives we have to define. So when we're working throughout the Caribbean, you know, um, sport has a meaning in a community um, and especially a small community and especially a nation that, um, th that does not necessarily feel like it's part of the global conversation. Sport is often the way that that country um, expresses uh, so much of its hope. And so the National Sports Authority of the Bahamas, which we formed through an act of parliament, um, which oversees the Queen Elizabeth Sports Center, the Canada Games Center, um, projects that we've done in other Caribbean nations and, and um, in Colombia and so on. Those projects are there. It's the same thing, except that you add to them often a sense of national pride, right. um, a, a connectivity to both country and and citizens. Uh, but it's the same thing. Uh, it, it's just done in a different scale. Right? No, absolutely. We uh, we have a project in the Caribbean as, as well. And it's it's uh, the same thing. It's just a different territory, but the people, the citizens, the government all want the same uh, benefits and impacts that they want here in the United States. Um, as a speaker, uh, you've done TED Talks on the power of self-coaching. Can you tell my viewers, just take a few, a few minutes, if you will, to just tell my viewers about the power of self-coaching? You know, I would say, Dee, and you've heard me say this, I think it's the single most important skill we can develop. That is the ability to coach ourselves. And I mean, actually coach yourself, talk to yourself if that's what it is required. Um, but to coach ourselves through challenge, which life brings to us, adversity, fear, and temptation. I don't believe that you can be successful without being an effective coach to yourself. In, in areas where you are accepting a challenge, faced with adversity, um, faced with fear, which we all have at various right. points, fear of rejection, fear of whatever it is, right. um, or um, temptation. And so the idea is to operationalize, to turn to action, this voice that you possess. Almost everyone viewing this has been down at some point and has had to look themselves in the mirror or has had to say to themselves, okay, let's go. For some people, it's happening every day. It's when it's just swinging their feet off the bed in the morning to face another challenging day. Yep. That moment is one where an individual says to herself, all right, girl, let's go. Or I might say to myself, come on, let's get it on. Right. Whatever that is. So I'm suggesting turn up the volume on that. And when you're struggling, stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. It's a really important shift to make. And you'll see it when you're spinning in your relationships with someone or you're making up a, a challenge that maybe could, you know, instead of focusing on the solution, uh, stop listening to yourself and say, hang on, what are we trying to get to here? Let's right. get to work. Shift the narrative. That's it's that simple. It's the little engine that could. I think I can. I think I can. Right. Which goes back to uh, a large part what I what I mentioned earlier, just mindset, you know, individuals. 
uh, mindset plays a vital role in um, how they uh, view situations and how they uh, take on challenges. You have uh, done such a great job with your organization that you have become uh, a highly sought after uh, expert uh, in this area. Uh, what do you think that you have done right that have put you in a position that everyone respects your expertise in this area? Well, I, I think what we've done right is collaborate. And I, I, that starts here with our team. Uh, I knew very early on, I've never thought of myself as the smartest person in the room. Yeah. <laughs> so I always knew there was somebody, there had to be somebody better than me to do right. this job that I was sitting there doing, right? Yep. I, and I wanted to do what I was, what only I could do, what I was specially built to do. And so um, early on, you know, Jason and I began a culture of collaboration. We built strong relationships through transparency. We onboard people, when we onboard people, they are trained in how to give and receive feedback. I receive feedback, so does Jason, publicly on the spot, right, right in front of our team. Um, and that culture of accountability, that comes out of not wanting the dysfunction that I grew up in. I yep. wanted it to be hyper-functional. Uh, so all of that has played a role. But most important is collaborating with our clients, is listening to what that individual community desires and wants, and crafting a program and a plan that works for them, and not holding on to a concept or an idea uh, any longer than is necessary. I think that I would tell you our core strategy and the center of our culture, but as a strategy, it's collaboration. Hey, I, look, Dev, I couldn't say it better. Uh, you know, my company, the P3 Group, the group is, is the collaborative Amazing. part of what we do, right? Uh, that's all of the partners and employees and vendors and, and people that come in, to the table every day and bring their uh, special skills, their special uh, insight and technical capabilities to the table to make us uh, a successful operation. So I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, in the 90s, uh, you opened one of the largest corporate team building centers in the US. Tell me about that project. Well, so that was, um, we had 10 acres at the Westin Innisbrook Resort at the time here in Palm Harbor. And that was before I had SFA. Um, we, we had a dollar a year lease and we built um, a leadership ropes course, team building center, all kinds of things, and then all this curriculum. So we were positioned to take people on tours out to our site and invite them to participate in these leadership programs when they were having a sales visit to Innisbrook. So literally 40 times a week, we would 20 to 40 times a week, we would be introduced to a prospect that was think, having a meeting or an event. We'd know what the goals were for the event. We'd know what they wanted to accomplish. We'd know who they were competing against Innisbrook with. And we would either deliver those programs at Innisbrook and on occasion they met us and we'd go deliver them somewhere else. Um, but that taught me a lot about putting myself and putting our organizations in a place where you have voluminous deal flow, right? Yep. As a start, um, inexpensive cost of goods, if you will, where you, you trade, you know, that's a cost of sale is I'll pay you a percentage of that. Um, that was really helpful and instructional because I was accustomed then to large volumes of deal flow. And we've built a similar model with our SEO and our other structures here so that we have large volumes of deal flow, which is comforting when you're an entrepreneur, no, as absolutely. you know. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> now you have obviously uh, been part of a, a, some life-changing developments. What exciting projects do you have in the pipeline right now um, at your firm? My goodness. So we are currently working on more than 80 new developments. Uh, within those, um, if I were to pick one, I'm, I would be potentially upsetting 79 others. But, <laughs> um, uh, but, what I, but I say this, what I really like is our move in the parks and recreation. What's happened in the last 40 years of parks and recreation is it's been privatized to the point where the only kids who are playing are kids who can afford to play travel ball or more or uh, fully commit to a single sport. And that's a real problem for health and social outcomes in communities. So um, this year we launched a parks um, initiative. We took on three entire cities park systems in 2022. I would expect that to expand quite significantly. 
I think those parks and recreation programs where we're gonna um, use our, our partnerships with hospital systems and others to fund an access program, I think will ultimately um, produce uh, uh, more so, uh, social um, and well-being and, and um, uh, impacts than everything else we've done to date because these are entire cities that are now gonna be um, activated and invited to participate and um, provided opportunities through the private sector to gain access to quality um, food and other things that so many of our communities have just been sort of um, uh, underserved yeah. with. And sport is one of those activity, right. you know, and triumph most importantly. Right. And, and why do you think that's the case? Because it seems to me just from, you know, obviously I'm in the, in the municipal space, it seems that there has not been as much um, concern about fully funding these type of programs uh, anymore, and which is probably why a lot of these programs are being privatized now. But what do you think the uh, contributing factors are? Well, I think when you're, so first, when a council is faced with budget decisions, um, every other department comes to them with quality data and reports, police and fire, school, so on and so forth. It's often the case that parks and recreation directors um, or managers are um, ill-equipped with data. It's not that they don't want to have it. They just don't have it. So they can't say these are the number of hours of activity we had this year. And as a result of that, we have reduced long term health care costs by X. They haven't had those calculators. Uh, and so I think that's been part of it. The, the first um, place we saw this was in the defunding of um, school sports. So physical education and school sports had both been significantly cut over the years. And there was a corresponding rise in childhood obesity and a corresponding rise in other social um, uh, challenges when we removed those sports. Then the parks and recreation um, systems were financially decimated in the 2008 recession and just never rebounded. So our strategy is to bring better metrics, um, better outcomes, and better partnerships into that um, system. And the partnerships have to have a stake in it. They have to have something to gain. So the CRAs and the medical partners and some of those become really critical. And then, you know, as you know better than I do, what P3 is capable of doing in properly financing and structuring right. um, sorts of outcomes is a vital piece. It's um, uh, without those, the, the, those collaborations, we're not gonna be able to do our work. No, absolutely, you're, you're correct. Deb, you've been highly successful and we know with every successful individual, uh, there are certain skills, uh, routines, habits uh, that help put them in that position. What do you think your top uh, skills or routines are that have helped you propel to the position that you're in today? Um, well, that's great. One, I think um, I'll say this, you know, happiness is so often related to how, who we compare ourselves to, right? So I hold it in my mind every day. I, I, don't, I don't know when I got in this habit, but when I wake up, I picture an individual who's in a circumstance not nearly as good as mine. And I hope that today I can help that individual or somebody um, similar. That, so I start my day by holding an intention to do good for others, whether it's a client or you know, uh, but but I often hold a, a child in my mind. I wake up early, so I tend to be up by around 4 a.m. Um, I use that time to quickly check in on emails overnight and other things. Right. Um, and uh, and then, you know, I uh, typically get some sort of a workout in um, and then I'm in the office. Um, I, I like to work early. My clock works early, so I'm at it early. And then I tend to use my afternoon time to catch up on phone calls and that sort of thing. But generally, I would say that that's my regular routine. Um, and then more at, in a more structured way within the organization, I have a way that I go and touch base with the few key individuals that I need to spend the most time with. And that's structured into our schedule so that we have time together on a weekly or a monthly. Right. You know, uh, that resonated with me because I'm a 3.34 a.m. guy myself. I just feel like that's just the <laughs> most productive time of the day. And I think people who are sleeping in at six or seven, they, they're missing the, uh, the mark, man, because you can just get so much done within that time frame. 
Uh, Deb, I really appreciate you uh, taking time out of your really busy schedule to be on my show. Uh, I think that your story is one of the American dream. It shows that no matter where you come from, no matter where you start, it's how you finish. And I think if you put your mind and, and ingenuity and hard work and ethics and commitment behind it, uh, you can do it right here in America. And so I appreciate you sharing your story with my viewers. And thank you so much for being on Self Made. Thank you, Dee. And thank you for everything you're doing in communities around the world, too. It's, uh, it, it's impressive. And I appreciate the, uh, the brotherhood and the alignment we have in our values. I really do. Thank you so much, Dave. And to my viewers, thank you for watching. Without you, there's no me.